Hey everyone, and welcome back to my Making a Game in the Desmos Graphing Calculator series. Last time we covered data storage and using it to make a defeat screen. In this video, we'll build on that by talking about improving our time variable and creating more types of enemies. Last video, when I was doing my research on residuals, I stumbled across a way to improve our time variable. Currently, our time variable has a show-stopping problem. If you see here, whenever the defeat screen is triggered, time continues on. This makes the game possible to win while the defeat screen is active, which really defeats the whole purpose of it. Additionally, we made our time variable a play indefinitely slider, which had limited our frame rate to 20 frames per second. With all the research I did for this video, I think I found a solution using residuals to fix both of these issues. The plan is to make T back into a forwards and backwards slider. Now, this might seem a little counterproductive, because why would I want T to bounce between two values? Well, my goal is to vary the minimum and maximum values of T so that the slider will always move forwards indefinitely. But how can we do that? What we can do is make a residual of t, like this, so using a few equations. Okay, now let's focus on some of t's properties. The minimum value of t will be dependent on three conditions. The first is if the defeat boolean is greater than 1, set the minimum value equal to t. This will be to stop the time variable from advancing if the defeat screen is active. The second condition is that if r equals 1, set the minimum value equal to t. Remember, if the reset variable r is 1, then it's not resetting. This condition is the normal state for the minimum. Lastly, if r equals 0, set the minimum equal to 0. This will reset the minimum back to 0 when the reset slider is triggered. The maximum slider is very similar to the minimum slider, with only a small difference. The t plus 4 relates to the fact that a slider takes 4 seconds to complete at normal speed. Our slider will take 4 seconds to move 4 units, which makes time move at an accurate pace. While t isn't ever going to finish because of the way the minimum and maximum bounds change with it, it still is going to travel at 1 unit per second. Okay, so now we'll replace all the uses of t in the slider equation with the residual of t and put it in our game. Because of the way the enemies and the player rely on t, we're able to just put in our new system as a drop-in replacement for the old one. I'll begin by starting t and setting r to 1, and you see that our enemy begins to move. Now when he touches the player, you see that the time variable stops. We can now put r to 0, or time is 0 again. Then r will go back to 1, and you see that time starts up again. This seems to be working. Now that t is fixed, I think it's time to add some more types of enemies. So far we just have a simple rolling enemy, which is good, but a little boring. I was thinking of adding a jumping enemy, a smashing enemy, and spikes for now. I expect to add some more enemies as I think of them, but I know I want to add these ones right now. Before we get started, I'll make a sandbox area that I can use to easily make new enemies. I'll replicate the time variable and size variables to aid in my testing. I'll start with the simplest to add for now, a jumping enemy. The jumping enemy is easy because we could just use the rolling enemies equations and change the y value. So here I'll type in the simple rolling enemy and let him go. Wait, come back, I still need- Okay, next I'll need to find a way to make him jump. Well, if you see here, the absolute value of sign creates a nice repeating parabola for our character to travel on. What I'll do is tack on negative a times the absolute value of sine of b times t to the y variable in the circle. a here is the height of the jump, and b is the period or how often the circle jumps. I want to keep these things separate to control manually. Now when we go to run it, the enemy jumps. I'll change the height he's jumping with A and the frequency he jumps at with B. Well, that certainly seems to be working. Alright, now that the jumpy enemy seems to be working, I think it's time to try making a smashing enemy. This will be very similar to a thwomp in Mario games. Again, he will have the same X term as the simple rolling enemy, but we'll need to find an equation for his Y term. Well, after messing around for a bit, I found that the equation negative sine to the tenth looked promising. I'll tack that on to the height equation for the circle and let it play. Once again, I kept the period and amplitude variables separate to mess around with. Okay, that wasn't awful, but it drops too infrequently and not for a far enough distance. I'll increase the amplitude to 3 and double the frequency and see how that looks. Not bad. I'm sure there'll be more tweaking in the future, but that'll work for now. The next enemy up is spikes. This one will be considerably harder to make than the previous circles because, well, it isn't a circle. We can't use that radius trick from last time to detect collision. We'll need a new solution. What we need is a new function to determine if the player is intersecting with the spikes. I could explain it mathematically, but I think a visual of the circle tracing the spikes hitbox would be better. You see that we start with the player on the ground, touching the spikes. As we move the player, the center of the circle will be traced. Okay, to start, the player moves straight up in order to stay tangent to the spikes. As it reaches the corner though, it rotates around it, creating a section of a circle. The player then moves horizontally to stay tangent to the spikes until it reaches the other corner. Again, a quarter of a circle is made until the circle touches the ground. We can break this path the center of the circle created into five pieces, 
the sides, the circular corners, and the top. We can create three equations based on the five sections to detect collision with the spikes. Since we know if the center of the circle is inside that area, there's a collision, and if it's outside that area, no collision is occurring. As a side note, if anyone was wondering why I chose circles for all the players and enemies, the collision detection is far easier to implement than any other shape, as you can probably tell. Okay, to start, I'll tackle the side pieces. As you can see here, the area between them is a collision zone. If a collision is occurring, the spike's X position must be between negative LC and LC, where LC is the side length of the collision area, and the player's Y position must be between 0 and HS, or the height of the spikes. We can turn this into an if statement by saying if negative LC is less than the spike's position, and the spike's position is less than LC, and the player's Y position is less than HS, a collision is occurring. Here I'll show a few examples of a circle intersecting that rectangular region and the resulting if statement, and here I'll show some examples of it not intersecting. Alright, we have rules that define whether or not there's an intersection, but how can we turn this into an equation? If you remember from the last video, we can use piecewise functions as if statements. We're going to be using them again here. A new addition to piecewise functions we can use is nested piecewise functions. We'll use them to create AND gates. Here I created a nested piecewise function to show you how it'll work. We'll start by having both variable a and b be 0. If we go through the function, the first condition fails, since a is not equal to 1. This makes variable c fall to condition 2, which makes it equal to 0. OK, let's reset and try making variable a equal to 1 this time. Well, now condition 1 can progress, since the first condition is satisfied. Inside condition 1, we now have two new conditions. This condition 1 says that if variable b is equal to 1, then c equals 1. Sadly, this isn't the case, so the new condition 2 becomes active, which sets c equal to 0. You can probably see now how both variable a and b must be equal to 1 for variable c to equal 1, otherwise c is going to equal 0. We can replace a and b with the rules we just created to make our own AND function. I'll rerun some of the examples of the collisions to show you that our new function does detect collisions correctly. Okay, that's one section down, but how about the other two? Well, the corners we've actually done before in episode 2. They'll just be detecting circular collisions. I'll show the equations for these on screen now, but if you want more detail on how I derived these, I recommend you check out the link up here. Finally, we have one section left. Actually, it's really similar to the first one we derived. We're looking to see if anything collided with this rectangular region here. You may have noticed that it overlaps the region we made before, but that's okay. As long as we cover all the space inside the region at least once and nothing outside of it, we're good. Well, here we know that if the center of the player is less than the height of the collision area, and the player's x position is between negative ls and ls, then a collision is occurring. Once again, I'll change this description to an actual equation to use. Alright, now that we have four separate equations that are detecting collision, we can use another piecewise function to join them all together. One thing to keep in mind is that lc is just ls plus z, the radius of the player circle, as shown here. Similarly, hc is just hs plus z. We'll use this to find the size of the collision area using the radius of the player and the size of the spikes. What you're seeing here is me trying to implement the collision. Of course, though, I made a few mistakes along the way. Instead of just fixing them in post, I wanted to highlight the errors. Here I have all the troublesome sections. Starting at the top, let's look at the sides collision. This piece controls the x check. This failed because it doesn't consider the lunge of the player. The same is true for the equation below it. Finally, the circle equations both had minus 2z, when really it should have just been minus z, since I'm measuring a distance of 1 radius, not 2. Here are the corrected equations. I'll make a quick demo in Desmos of the spikes to show you that indeed, this monstrous equation does function properly. Now that we have spikes implemented, we can use them anywhere. I probably won't be using them a ton, however, because it takes a lot more time to implement them into the game, and they generate a lot more lag considering they use so many more collision checks than just a circle would. Wow, this video stretched on longer than I expected. In fact, I was going to implement a shooting enemy, but I just ran out of time. Thanks for watching. Make sure to tune in next time for adding the shooting enemy and other level objects. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask below. Until next time.